In the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. I have to come in the Son. Okay. Uh, I greet you with great joy on this day. It's a beautiful one. The Sunday, the first one of the great and holy land, called the Sunday of the Triumph of Orthodoxy. And one of the messages that I'd like to bring to you today is that it is a very dangerous one for those who observe it because it can easily become a Sunday of the triumph of hypocrisy. In the Gospel lesson today we heard about the Apostle Philip being called, follow me. This is where the beginning is, follow me. And the destination is the triumph, the triumphant church, the victorious church, the ones who rejoice in the kingdom by the throne of the Father eternally, sharing in His glory, uncreated by essence God, shared with us, naturally made men. The church begins at this point with follow me. Our journeys as Orthodox Christians begin with follow me. But you know, Philip himself struggled with this. We hear about him later calling on the Lord towards the end of the mission of the ministry of the Lord. He said, show us the Father. And Jesus says to him, well, what do you mean? I've been with you for so long, Philip. And you asked me to show you the Father? He says, if you see me, you see the Father. And then later we know that his doubts were completely removed at Pentecost with the coming of the Holy Spirit. And the, uh, the ones who followed Jesus became apostles. And they went into the world to continue the life of the church. That is not easy. There's a fight that they had to fight. And there's no mistake here that the church calls from the early centuries those who are engaged in the battle to be triumphant, who have been called, follow me, to be triumphant. The militant church, or the church militant, as opposed to the victorious church, the militant church. The church has been from day one in the shadows of the, of the difficult, aggressive surroundings, behind the enemy lines, struggle to survive, you see. But they always had Christ with them, struggle to survive. The apostles, St. Justin the Martyr, 2nd century, St. Basil the Great, whose liturgy we are about to, we are celebrating. All the martyrs, continues to our days, communist fears, persecutions in the Middle East, Egypt, this country now, not too far from being restricted to do certain things or forced to do certain things not according to the tradition of the church. But about, among those times that continuously rolled one after another, one after another, in which the church is engaged in the struggle to, to survive and move forward non-stop. A big period of time had to do with the icons. Yes, the very ones that we have in front of us here today is something unique probably, having them covered with pollen. Doesn't happen very often in the Orthodox Church, but today it does happen. The icons have been with the church now from the, from the beginning. We know of the, of the Shroud of Turin. The, the tradition brings us the story of Veronica who offered Jesus during the time of Passion her cover, head cover, and he wiped his face with it. We know of St. Luke, the evangelist, the doctor, also being an artist, a painter. It's something that we recall in the Paraclesi service every time we sing it. That uh, the church always in the love for God, in a desire to be triumphant, recalled by means of images, words, hymns, the very fact that we're Christians. What does that mean? That for us, God condescended, took flesh, and He was one like us, like this. See? You can touch God, you can talk to God, you can hear God talking, because He was in the person of Jesus Christ. God the Father in Jesus Christ shows who He is. Shows his wisdom, shows his word, shows his love, shows his truth. 
in the person of Jesus Christ. And Christians put this to heart to remember him because they were called to be like him, like we are, to grow like him. This is why by the time of the 4th century, St. Basil the Great now, this is the 300s, late 300s, made it very clear, a thing that we call in our services often uh, today, that when we venerate an icon, we venerate the prototype, the one who is depicted in the icon. In other words, we don't say, whoa, this is a beautiful piece of wood here and the paint and the enamel and everything else with the glass there. No, but rather say we venerate the Lord Jesus, the Holy Virgin Mother, St. Nectarios, St. Spiridon. And as opposed to what? Worshipping the objects. This is unknown by us and we should be able to stand when others accuse us. You Orthodox worship idols. Say, I'm sorry. The church has been saying clearly, where have you been, huh? For 1600 years that we don't worship wood, but we venerate the image in there. Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, Justinian, 635, gigantic. As I said last night, it can take 10,000 people to this day now being converted back to a mosque. Unfortunately, you can see the mosaics up there, Panagia and the Lord, pieces of them, as much as the Turks could took down and cover it over time. The sixth century. So then when iconoclasm came, 726, 726, Leo III, the Isaurian, went off according to the conditions of the time, influenced by Islam, and he forced the icons to come off the churches of people's homes and people to renounce publicly that they don't venerate, they don't worship the idols. That's what they said. This is something that we, we kind of saw just a little bit, a little tiny, tiny bit in this country when just last year the statues started to come down of Christ. Some icons were, 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 uh, were uh, defiled in some certain churches. Remember when the Black Lives Matter whole thing started? That there was a, a confusing time, especially for the, Orthodox, for the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church in our country. And I don't know if that has calmed down. I hope so. God help us. But that was a little bit concerning. Now think about this. The government to tell you, emperor after emperor for five generations, 117 years, to destroy the icons. Take them out. If you don't, you're dead. And boy, the streets are filled with blood. Many died because they refused to take the icons down and have them burned in public squares. So during this time, 117 years, we know of the Seventh Ecumenical Council in 787. Empress Irene called this. And then the council all getting together re restated and made it clear what we will hear at the end of the service today in the proclamation. That we do not worship idols. We venerate the ones in the images there. And that Christ is revealed to us not only through his incarnation and body visibly in, in the icons, but also his word, the gospel, the gospel is shown in the world by those who lived it. So you are called to live the gospel just like those before us. And those who lived it, who are cleansed, who are, who are purified, who are baptized, who receive the Holy Spirit. Everything St. Paul talks about in the commandments. Those living witnesses of the gospel were sanctified, were holy, were illumined, were in communion with God. And therefore, they are witnesses of the, of the word of God, of the gospel. They, they too can be depicted. So this is what happened. The church, under the tremendous pressure of the iconoduls, iconoclasts, forgive me, those who didn't want the icons, continued until the year 843. When another woman now, how interesting this is, tells much about the soul of, of women here and their love, the way they relate to God. Theodora, the mother of the emperor being too young, Michael, called for an end of, these, of the persecution of the icons publicly. 
venerated the icons in processions taking on the first day of Lent, which is of the first Sunday of Lent, this one here, March 11th, 843. A great procession was, uh, was taken to the city, to the, to the church of the, of the Holy Wisdom, Christ the Wisdom. And uh, uh, the icons since then have been reinstalled and they continue to be with us to this day and hopefully unto the ages of ages. Now, why, why is this uh, the triumph of orthodoxy here? And I mentioned earlier today that it's a little danger for us to, to, uh, to look at it in the, or to, to engage in it in a way that could be uh, making us more triumph, be the triumph of, of hypocrisy. Well, first of all, it was not triumphant because the icons make us orthodox. Hey, we're orthodox because our church has 200 icons. Or I'm orthodox because at home I have the prayer cordon with the icons, you know? If this was the case, it would be a dead faith. We would be dead now. Nobody would be around. This is not what the triumph was about. You might think, and I'd like you to go over this now, that it was the triumph of orthodoxy because the right group the Orthodox venerating the icons, one over the other guys. A victory. Something, a, a momentary event in the history of the church, you know. And uh, we remember that. Well, as much as this might have been social, political, geographical, it was all in the East. The West didn't have this. That's why if you go to Italy, go to Ravenna, you'll see Byzantine mosaics there from the early centuries in Greek. So it was not that the, the one side was victorious over the other one. There's something much deeper in here, brothers and sisters. And we got to put this to heart and see how we make the day today the triumph of orthodoxy and not the triumph of hypocrisy. It is the very fact that the icon, the image of God, the witness to God's incarnation and His love for mankind, the images that show his love in practice, teaching, going to the cross, resurrected, ascending, sending the Holy Spirit. These icons have been in the heart of the church from the beginning, in the 6th century, in the 7th century, in the 8th century, in the 9th century, and today. The icons are in the heart of the faithful. This is the great victory that the surrounding enmity could not remove this in five generations. Do you know what, what your ancestors were doing five generations ago? Wow, look how fast we change. But despite this 117 years, the icons did not leave the hearts of the faithful. And the church survives, survived, has survived, and will survive any evil attacks from the outside. You ought to know this. Would this be from the iconoclast? Would this be from the communist? Would this be from, from Washington? Would this be from LGBTs? The church will survive. Her spirituality will survive. And this is the great victory that the spirituality of the church survived and became the faith, the force of faith for the whole world. Glory be to God. What a beautiful thing. So, in this mode of survival that is constantly engaging the church, we see it we see the triumph, and triumph of, ortho, of orthodoxy. One of the fathers of the last century of blessed memory said that orthodoxy itself is the triumph. The very orthodoxy. In other words, wow, let's see what we're, we're sitting here on a gold mine, you know? We're sitting in a gold mine. What's triumphant in the orthodoxy? Look at the early centuries, the mindset of the fathers. The mindset of the fathers is instrumental to us 
interpreting and living today in everything we do. The Holy Father, St. Basil the Great, St. John Chrysostom, and going through the centuries, the mindset of the church has been preserved, triumph of orthodoxy over what? Look at the others in the West and see what they have. Compare fullness, solid beauty to cracks. What else do we have? We have aesthetics in the Orthodox Church. Triumphant hymnology. Those who were in church this last week, you witnessed this. Every single hymn is packed with beauty, wisdom, and tremendous faith brought to us to embrace. The people who wrote them were themselves in the mind of the fathers. What else do we have? The beautiful iconography style. I call this the Byzantine style, the tradition of iconography. You can tell who, Spir who Saint Spiridon is because it's been like this from the first ecumenical council in the early 300s. People saw him and he's been on icons as a holy man since then. What else do we have? We have the beautiful churches. Unlike ours today out here, we have buildings that are witnesses of the tradition of the Orthodox faith. What else is triumphant in the Orthodox Church? The unity. And don't think, oh no, how can this be? Because the, the Ukrainians are shouting at the ecumenical patriarch all kinds of bad things. How can this be? Brothers and sisters, the church is not an organization. The church is a living organism. The Holy Spirit gives life to the church. And the living organism has problems, you know, like a living family, husband and wife. That's a pluralistic organism, the family. We know very well of this. But what brings unity to the church? The seven ecumenical councils. The holy capital T tradition. The way we celebrate part of that. Divine liturgies and so on. So this is orthodoxy triumphant. The triumph. The orthodoxy itself is the triumph. So where is that thing that I mentioned earlier? Why did I say that? There's a danger here to look at it and say, well, it's a triumph of hypocrisy. Well, brothers and sisters, while the church is the body of Christ, the church militant fighting, struggling every single day in the front lines of society of the world, from the times of Christ who was killed, by the ones whom he loved to today while this is happening what are we doing there's a saying say if you don't struggle as a Christian you're a dead Christian in other words if we don't go up if you don't try to go up they're down at the bottom of the ladder so the question is while the church is triumphant, are we, you and I, triumphant? How is this to be? How can I be triumphant over the mess of the world, over the challenges, over the family issues, over death, over COVID, over policies that we don't like? Over church friction. Are we triumphant over these? Unless we struggle and engage in it, we will not be triumphant. And the church today, on this very first Sunday, brings the theme of the triumph of orthodoxy. Why? Because she's given us the means to be triumphant over fear, over passions, over sin, over death. But how do I do that? By being in the church. 
by being with a triumphant one. Because if I'm outside, on this day I come with the icon up, and I might think I'm Orthodox, the right faith. Hey, not only that, but I have a cousin in Mount Athos, as Father Hopper says. Then there will be the triumph of hypocrisy. This is a great, tough thing at the end of a week where the church has been calling us, come here, join me. This is what I bring to you, the triumphant church, such that you too will be triumphant to step over the enemies. We're called now to be considerate and look back. This last week, more like the Holy Week in terms of services. Oh, what a beautiful, fantastic. In fact, the, starting with the weekends before, there was a bell that rang every day in the services. In the triumphant church, we heard the voice of the bell. I almost, I was inclined to ask the bell to sing it for you. You might not remember it. You might not remember it. Every evening we heard, my soul, my soul, arise. Isn't this interesting? That the church is calling on us every day, arise, arise. Why are you sleeping? Why are you sleeping this time? Arise. And this message comes to us today. There's still time. The great and holy land is given to us to join the triumphant church. Triumph, triumph of the Orthodox Church. So we too become triumphant when? When the great triumph will be proclaimed at the time of the resurrection of the Lord. In just a few weeks. In just a few weeks. So then, the calling is to bring the icons, not the ones of the holy people from Mount Athos, not the one of St. Fortini, of the transfiguration, but rather bring this living icon, my body all defiled, as the hymn says at the, at the matins here. By that time, hopefully, cleansed, having repented and prepared for the passion of the Lord to receive the light of the resurrection. This is the message. The triumph of orthodoxy will be for us the triumph of orthodoxy when we work on cleansing the images of God engraved, etched in our bodies and our souls within us. And this is the time to do it together. May the good Lord give us a beautiful celebration today as we will remember those who gave their lives who had no, no, nothing to keep on the side for themselves when they had to witness for the icons and the very truth of the incarnation of God. We remember them. May the good Lord give us good understanding, good eyes and big ears to take this energy at home and want desire to be like them. To be like them. And that when we, have, when we look at icons in our homes, in the, in the church and so on, Remember that they are those in the triumphant church, the glorious church, the victorious church, and that we're called to be militant, to fight every day till the last breath. May the good Lord help us to do so. Amen.